Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India
this person so successful in business. So, what strategies this person followed, um, what is the company you know, selling, what strategies did the company use, how did they overcome competition. So, uh, what has been the progress over you know, past few years. So, all these information um, you uh, collect and you analyze and then you come to some conclusion. So, this base is based on your uh, research question. So, if your research question is so to find out what made this person so successful in such a short span of time, you focus on strategies used and other things. So, this is you know uh, clearly a called a case study. It could also you know be about an unsuccessful case. So, you had a big company and then it collapsed. For example, uh, Nokia uh, till some years back was uh, the world leader in manufacturing of cell phones, but later on um, uh, the company you know shut down and later on um, that brand uh, Microsoft. So, how this drastic change happened? So, what made to this fall? So, you can actually uh, do a study about causes which led to um, fall of a, such a big company as well. So, this is what we call case study. So, these case studies often lead to testable hypotheses and allow us to study rare phenomena. So, this is something not which is uh, observed in everyday life, uh, then it is not worth an in depth study. So, this is something rare and it, it can also you know uh, come up with some principles, uh, some you know uh, 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 implications for wider public. So, that is the um, reason for uh, in depth uh, case study. So, uh, if you say that okay, uh, see if you do not change yourself according to market trends no matter how big you are, you will collapse. So, this is your testable hypothesis say. So, you study the case of Nokia company to you know verify this hypothesis. So, this you know can apply to many other companies as well. So, here it has a wider implication. So, that is why you look at uh, uh, case uh, study. Next is a survey method. So, here um, participants answer questions administered through interviews or questionnaires. After participants answer the questions, researchers describe the responses. So, in order for the survey to be both reliable and valid, it is important that the questions are constructed properly. So, questions should be written so they are clear and easy to comprehend. So, this is an important part of um, survey. Uh, so, for example, you want to find out what features are most valued by students in the age range of 20 to 25. So, you want to do a survey, you know find out which features in a mobile phone are uh, you know highly valued, highly sought after. And then probably you want to incorporate those features in your brand new mobile phone. So, you conduct a survey. So, you can do it through a questionnaire. You design a questionnaire which has you know some set of questions, mostly um, objective multiple choice items with specific focus. Um, and then uh, you send these questionnaires out to uh, target population, say in this case students in the age range of 20 to 25 across the country and then you get the responses and then you tabulate those. Say uh, out of uh, 2000 um, respondents uh, about 60 percent have said a good uh, you know, camera is a an important thing for a mobile phone. So, then you focus on that specific feature.
feature. So, this is how you use. Sometimes you can also interview people personally and gather data that is actually more time consuming and um, if you have a smaller population then it works best. Okay. Now, coming to uh, the format of uh, reports. So, if you recall, uh, you know, we first started with why you know we have research reports. So, you conduct a research and you then report its findings. So, that is why you know we use research reports and then we looked at some basic uh, you know research studies uh, designs. So, like observation, um, randomized uh, you know experiments, uh, case study methods, survey methods. So, after you have conducted the research study, after you analyze the data and you have now the findings, now you have to uh, report. So, uh, the format, general format of a research report is given here. Um, sometimes, you know, this format, you know, varies. Uh, some organizations have their own specific format, uh, but this is you know a general format we are looking at. So, a, a report has a title, an abstract, introduction section, methods, research methodology, results, discussion and references. So, here you may recall that this is somewhat similar to the structure of a research proposal. There also you have an introduction section, you talk about methodology and uh, instead of uh, you know results and discussions, you have sort of you know implications, you, know, you uh, talk about what you expect. Now, you have conducted the research and so you have the results with you. So, you report the actual results here, not what you expect that you do in a research proposal. So, looking at these components in detail, the first one is title. So, title um, you know, should contain the essential elements of the report and ideally not more than 12 words. If the title is too long, it is too clumsy. Uh, look at an example, the effect of temperature changes on the germination of wheat. So, this clearly tells that this researcher looked at two variables. So, one is temperature change and uh, the second one is germination of wheat. So, um, this also you know um, indicates you that probably the researcher looked at um, how wheat germinates in different temperature settings. Um, they may might have happened in naturalistic contexts or in laboratory you know uh, manipulated settings. So, somehow you know this gives you an idea about what could have happened. So, the title here has to be very clear. Second is abstract. So, the function of an abstract is to help potential reader identify whether your report is relevant to his or her research interests. So, abstract is actually like a summary. So, it captures main points of each part of your report. So, going back to it, so you have an introduction section where you introduce the field. Um, you briefly review research and then you talk about your methodology, then your results and discussion. So, main you know uh, components of each of these sections you put together in an abstract. So, therefore, it is advised that you write abstract once your complete report is ready. Then you know what uh, you know sections what uh, you need to focus on uh, in, in each of those components and then you can write the abstract. Introduction section. So, uh, just like in a 
research proposal, this section introduces um, the subject, gives background information and then reasons for carrying out the work and then also reviews major studies in that particular field of study. Next section methods. So, here it includes details of your research methodology. So, what tools you used, how you collected your data, how you analyzed data, who were your subjects. So, how did you approach them? So, uh, details about data collection procedures, all the details you include under this section. Next results. So, um, here you talk about your results. So, you merely report your uh, data here. Say you have administered uh, a survey and so you have say some findings, some you know results of it. So, 60 percent people have liked this, 20 percent people have not liked this. So, only 5 percent people have gone for this. A majority of people say 80 percent did not respond to this question. So, you merely here present, you do not offer your comments on those findings. So, that is what you do in discussion. So, here you discuss your main findings and then you comment on the effectiveness of your research. Also, you uh, talk about any limitations um, if your study had. Obviously, um, you know no study can be perfect. So, you may have missed out on something or you did not expect one particular variable to play a very important role. So, um, such limitations are also included under uh, this section. Here you may also you know give indications for future research, um, what are, you know the uh, so there was a gap your study has you know uh, filled in a part of it. So, there is still something more to be explored. So, all those details go under this section. Conclusion um, you summarize your work. Uh, sometimes this conclusion section um, you know is uh, optional. You might include you know as I mentioned suggestions for further research and limitations under discussion itself. Then uh, you have uh, references, you list all the works you have consulted. So, these are uh, main components of a research report. Now, we will look at an example to actually understand how a research report is written. So, this is an, uh, an extract from a survey report. What is it? Let us find out. Uh, the title of this report is Communicating About Oceans Results of a National Survey. This was conducted for the ocean project by Belden Rosanellos and Stewart and American Viewpoint. This happened in October 1999. So, what was the aim of this survey and who were the people who participated in this? Let us look at this. In a national telephone survey for the OCEAN project, Belden Rasanello and Stewart BRS in collaboration with American Viewpoint explored the public's connections, values, attitudes and knowledge relating to the oceans. Our goal was to better understand what needs to be communicated to build awareness and to increase Americans concerns about the health of the oceans. So, key word here is, is a, this was done at uh, the country level, national level. Then this was a telephonic survey. This uh, survey explored public's connections, values, attitudes, knowledge relating to the oceans. So, why 
they wanted to understand what people know and what needs to be communicated to build awareness and increase Americans concerns about the health of the oceans. So, how many people participated? The national survey for the OCEAN project was conducted among 1500 adults in the continental United States from July 24th to August 8th, 1999. So, 1500 adults participated means it excluded children and this was the duration. So, from July 24th to August 8th, 1999. So, uh, 1500 adults, they were telephoned and they were asked questions about, you know, uh, what they know about the oceans and uh, they responded. So, a sample question from this um, uh, survey is given here. Question 1 to 5, here are some issues the country will be facing over the next few years. I would like to ask you how big of a priority each issue should be. Let us start with you know, blank, should it be an extremely high priority, a high, a middle, a low or an extremely low priority for the country to address. So, you saw here there was a blank, this was filled with these issues. Improving public education, improving the health care system, lowering crime rates, preserving social security, protecting the environment. So, there are five issues, so thus they become five questions. So, for example, question one will be something like this. Here are some issues the country will be facing over the next few years. I would like to ask you how big of a priority each issue should be. Let us start with improving public education. Should it be an extremely high priority, a high, a middle, a low or an extremely low priority for the country to address. Similarly, so uh, they asked questions about each of these uh, issues. So, you can clearly see here uh, the question is very clear. They are giving uh, these uh, asking people to uh, use a rating scale. What are the points on this rating scale? Extremely high priority, a high, a middle, a low or an extremely low. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, 5 point rating scale. Okay. So, here is an extract from you know the stats section. Uh, this is about uh, the question we just looked at. So, how people responded to this question? Let us look at this. Descriptive stats, priorities for the country. Question 1 to question 5. Here are some issues the country will be facing over the next few years. I like to ask you how big of a priority each issue should be. Let us start with blank. So, each of these issues come here. Should it be an extremely high priority, a high, a middle, a low or an extremely low priority for the country to address? So, this was the question which was asked to um, people who participated in the survey and uh, how you know, people responded, it has been tabulated here. So, if you look at this table, improving public education, improving the healthcare system, lowering crime rates preserving social security, protecting the environment. So, this has been made bold because this was the uh, focus area. Uh, five point scales, extremely high priority, high priority, middle priority, low priority, extremely low priority and then percentage of people who said so. 46 percent, 43, 9, 1, 1, 37 percent, 46, 13, 3, 1, 36 percent, 45, 16, 3, null, 35 percent, 48, 14, 2, 1, 32 percent, 46, 18, 3, 1. So, this is you know descriptive stats, it is given in a tabular format. Now, uh, you know that table is explained here. 
The top priority for Americans is improving education with nearly half of Americans, 46% saying it is an extremely high priority. So go back to this table. So you see here, so this is what they are talking about, about nearly 50% said improving public education is the uh, issue which uh, of extremely high priority. Following closely are improving health care 37 percent, lowering crime rates 36 percent and preserving social security 35 percent. Protecting the environment while considered a top priority by about a third of the public 32 percent takes somewhat of a back seat to these more immediate concerns. So, here the writer looks at this column and so compares how each of these issues have got you uh, know have, have been rated as extremely high important and then points out that protecting the environment um, is just 32 percent in fact the lowest among these five so this is you know reporting uh, descriptive stats in a tabular format and that has been explained here now this is more um, detailed stats here so this gives percentage so say 46% of people said improving public education is extremely um, issue of extreme high priority now this gives the breakup so out of people so how many were male how many female then the age ranges here then uh, you know uh, race white black hispanic geographic uh, you know uh, regions northeast midwest south west then um, people um, based on you know the, who show some kind of interest in wildlife and others so zoo visitors aquarium visitors science museum visitors non visitors and then people living near ocean and people living not near the ocean so, the question is here the same, here are some issues the country will be facing over the next few years. I would like to ask you how big of a priority each issue should be, should it be an extremely high priority, a high, a middle, a low or a extremely low priority for the country to address. So, here they are reporting only about this issue protecting the environment. So, if you look at this breakup, this is the aggregate thing total. So, out of 1500 people. So, if you recall, I am going back. So, total of 1500 adults participated in this. Out of it, 32 percent have said it, it, it is an extremely important thing. Now, there is breakup. So, out of total male participants, 27 percent said this is extremely high priority. Female 36 percent. Similarly, you know, age ranges you can see here 18 to 29, 30 to 44, 45 to 59, 60 plus, then white, black, Hispanic. So, you see here and then uh, geographic uh, regions, northeast, midwest, south and west. So, then zoo visitors, aquarium visitors, science museum visitors, non-visitors. So, here probably you can see that these numbers are relatively high when compared to this number. So, the, these things will be your next step, you interpret these uh, stats. Now, uh, this particular table is explained here. Protecting the environment is a higher priority for women, younger Americans less than 45, blacks, residents of the northeast and midwest and those who have visited a zoo, aquarium or science museum in the last year than their counterparts in society. It is a very neat way of summing up uh, you know the findings. 4 in 10 about 38 percent Americans have visited a zoo in the last year and 3 in 10 have visited an aquarium 30 percent or science museum 28 percent. 
visitors to zoos, aquariums and science museums are more likely than the population as a whole to be younger, less than 45, to have children, to have high household incomes, high levels of education and to work in white collar or professional jobs. So, more details about this particular population. So, first you uh, report it in a table and then you explain it. So, um, that is how you know you conduct a survey and you report it. Now, we will look at a complete uh, research report. This is taken from RMIT University. So, let us look at this. So, let us first look at the uh, subsections here. So, this is executive summary or you can also call it a summary or an abstract. Then you have introduction section, then methods here, then results. So, under results some tables you find, then discussion also you know, known as interpretation of results, then you have conclusion, then recommendation this is a specific section probably you know this is something to do with uh, research, we will look at it in detail. So, now let us read this in detail. Executive summary, the aim of this report was to investigate Unilab staff attitudes to personal mobile phone use in staff and team meetings. A staff survey on attitudes towards the use of mobile phones in the staff team meetings was conducted. The results indicate that the majority of staff find mobile phone use a major issue in staff meetings. The report concludes that personal mobile phones are disruptive and should be turned off in meetings. It is recommended that Unilab develops a company policy banning the use of mobile phones except in exceptional circumstances. So, this is about a particular company Unilab and um, uh, the staff of its company, the attitudes of the people there towards mobile phone use in staff and team meetings. So, they just wanted to, uh, the researchers wanted to observe you know whether people use mobile phones in meetings and uh, how others feel about it. So, this is the aim. Okay. Uh, so, what they did? Um, the researchers conducted a survey. So, this is you know how they got the data and the results are here that they find it as a major issue. So, wh why is it a major issue? They are disruptive and you know uh, there is a strong recommendation here that the company develop a policy banning the use of this. So, we saw that you know there are sections like introduction, methodology, uh, results, discussion, recommendation. So, your executive summary or abstract represents each of those sections. Okay. Now, we move to introduction. There has been a massive increase in the use of personal mobile phones over the past 5 years and there is every indication that this will continue. According to Black 2002, by 2008 almost 100 percent of working people in Australia will carry personal mobile phones. Black describes this phenomena as serious in the extreme, potentially undermining the foundations of communication in our society, 2002, page 167. So, citation styles. Currently, at Unilab, 89 percent of staff have personal mobile phones. So, here you can see the writer introduces the topic. The topic here is the use of personal mobile phones in uh, you know specifically in Australia. Writer also refers to a study Black 2002 uh, which predicts that you know 
by 2008 almost 100 percent of people will have this um, and this is going to be a very serious uh, phenomenon. So, this introduces the topic it also uh, straight away comes to the issue. Then it comes to this uh, organization Unilab which is now the focus. Recently, a number of staff have complained about the use of personal mobile phones in meetings and asked what the official company policy is. At present, there is no official company policy regarding phone use. This report examines the issue of mobile phone usage in staff meetings and small team meetings. It does not seek to examine the use of mobile phones in the workplace at other times, although some concerns were raised. So, this clearly comes to the uh, problem there which is has been explored. So, a number of staff complained about the use of personal phones and they asked if there is any official policy. So, as a result, a team probably was constituted and the research team now uh, has examined the issue of mobile phone use in, uh, so the context is again here very specific, in staff meetings and small team meetings. So, this does not include the use of mobile phones um, you know in the workplace at other times, this is only during meetings. For the purposes of this report, a personal mobile phone is a personally funded phone for private calls as opposed to an employer funded phone that directly relates to carrying out a particular job. Since this is about the use of personal mobile phones in meetings, um, the writers very clearly here distinguish between a personal mobile phone and an employer funded phone. So, something which is related to a job that is not studied here. So, if you recall in the beginning we listed two kinds of reports, um, assessment report and, and the report which clear only documents the documentation report. So, this is an example of you know an assessment report there has been a problem. So, um, a study has been conducted examining that particular issue in detail and it has come up with some solutions to address that particular problem. So, this is a clear example of an assessment uh, report. Okay, the next section methods, this research was conducted by questionnaire and investigated Unilab staff members attitudes to the use of mobile phones in staff team meetings. A total of 412 questionnaires were distributed with employees fortnight pay slips see appendix 1. The questionnaire used Leckard scales to assess social attitudes see Smith 2002 to mobile phone usage and provided open ended responses for additional comments. Survey collection boxes were located in every branch for a four week period. No personal information was collected, the survey was voluntary and anonymous. So, this is about the research methodology. So, how they went about it? So, we saw earlier that this was a survey. So, now we have details about it. So, the researchers designed a questionnaire and um, how many number is here 412. These were uh, given to probably all employees, but the survey was voluntary and anonymous. So, the people were not forced to participate in it. Whoever filled it and um, dropped in survey collection boxes, they were uh, only those responses were uh, analyzed. Uh, and um, anonymous people who participated, they were not required to give personal details like name and uh, 
other details which you know help identify that person. So, what did the questionnaire include? The questionnaire used Leckard scales to assess social attitudes to mobile phone usage. So, this has been used in a previous study. So, this is your justification to use this particular tool. Also, uh, there was some space for open ended responses. Next section results, there was an 85 percent response rate to the questionnaire. It means out of you know uh, 412 distributed about 85 percent of those people responded. A breakdown of the responses is listed below in table 1. It can be clearly seen from the results that mobile phones are considered to be disruptive and should be turned off in meeting. So, this is kind of summarizes the results. The stats are given here in table 1. Personal mobile phone usage in staff and team meetings is not a problem, an issue, disruptive, phones should be permissible, phone should be turned off, allowed in some circumstances. So, these were the question uh, things and the people were asked to uh, respond along these four uh, scales, strongly ugly, agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. So, not a problem. 5 percent said strongly agree, 7 percent agree, 65 percent disagreed, strongly disagreed, 23 percent. So, that is uh, uh, other uh, points were also you can see the responses. The survey also allowed participants to identify any circumstances where mobile phones should be allowed in meetings and also assessed staff attitudes towards receiving personal phone calls in staff meetings in open ended questions. These results showed that staff thought that in some circumstances for example, medical or emergencies receiving personal phone calls was acceptable, but generally receiving personal phone calls was not necessary. So, so you can see here allowed in some circumstances. So, people have said and some examples included medical or other emergencies. Here also you can see that 80 percent of people strongly agreed that the mobile phone usage in meetings is disruptive. Now, uh, discussion, it can be seen from the results in table 1 that personal mobile phone use is considered uh, to be a problem. However, it was acknowledged that in some situations it should be permissible. 80 percent of the recipients considered mobile phones to be highly disruptive and there was strong support for phones being turned off in meetings 85 percent. Only 12 percent thought that mobile phone usage in staff and team meetings was not a problem, whereas 85 percent felt it was an issue. The results are consistent throughout the survey. Many of the respondents 62 percent felt that in exceptional circumstances mobile phones should be allowed, for example, medical, but there should be protocols regarding this. These findings are consistent with other studies. According to Smith 2005, many companies have identified mobile phones as disruptive and have banned the use of mobile phones in meetings. Huawei 2004 claims that 29 percent of staff meeting time is wasted through unnecessary mobile phone interruptions. This affects time management, productivity and team focus. So, referring to some other studies, the this you know the researchers here uh, cl clearly say that mobile phone usage is disruptive. Conclusion, the use of mobile phones in staff meetings is clearly disruptive and they should be switched off. 
most staff felt it is not necessary to receive personal phone calls in staff meetings except under certain circumstances, but permission should first be sought from the team leader, manager or chair. Because this was constituted to address a specific issue, there is a recommendation section. It is recommended that Unilab develops an official policy regarding the use of mobile phones in staff meetings. The policy should recommend mobile phones are banned. Mobile phones may be used in exceptional circumstances, but only with the permission of the appropriate manager or chair. Finally, the policy needs to apply to all staff in the company. So, the report ends with strong uh, recommendation. So, summing up, today we have looked at research report. We also looked at two samples. One a survey report about you know people's attitude towards you know oceans. The second one was a kind of uh, an assessment uh, report. It investigated an issue and uh, presented uh, you know solutions to address that particular issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm.